Hello, everybody. Okay. Welcome to the Museum of the African Diaspora online. My name is Elizabeth Gethel, and I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Museum in San Francisco. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the challenging circumstances we are all in, and I hope everyone in the audience today is safe and healthy. And especially for those of us who are in California, I hope we're all staying safe from the fires and the smoke. I also want to say that MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Rayshard Brooks, and so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those fourth forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples whose land we are located. With deep respect, MOAD acknowledges that even in virtual space, our people, our work, and our network servers are on native lands and thank the indigenous people of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Today, we are thrilled to be presenting a program that explores the art of storytelling in the African diaspora. I want to acknowledge that this program was conceived of and designed by Kayla Redman. Uh, she's an intern in the public programs department this summer, working remotely from the Washington, D.C. area. So I want to thank her for the amazing work that she's done all summer, culminating in this fabulous public program. The program will include conversation, storytelling, and will end with a Q&A with the audience. So if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box as we go through the program. And we would also love to hear how the diaspora is represented today. So please take a moment to type where you are joining us from today in the chat. To begin the program, I'm going to introduce our moderator. Reina J. Leon is an afro boricua poet and scholar and educator who believes in collective action and community work. The profound power of holding space for the telling of our stories and the liberatory practice of humanizing education. She is the author of three collections of poetry and two chapbooks, a founding editor of the Ascentos Review, an online quarterly international journal devoted to the promotion and publication of Latinx arts and the co-founder of StoryJoy, a consulting consultancy agency through which story is seen as the pathway to a centering joy for BIPOC educators and community workers. She is a full professor of education at St. Mary's College of California, only the third black person, all of us black women, all of them, not me, and the first Afro-Latina to achieve that rank there. So thank you so much for uh, joining us and for moderating this program today, Reina. I am thrilled to be with you all today. So thrilled um, for the invitation and to hold space for our incredible artists. I'm going to read those bios. Um, and I have to say, I shared in our gathering before we came into this um, public space that I did, I did a deep dive into all of the uh, videos available and I was just um, enchanted y'all. This is going to be so incredible. Um, so our our first artist today is Aunt Pearlie Sue um, as the creation of Ms. Anita Singleton Prather, um, a, a native of the Sea Islands of Beaufort, South Carolina. Based on her grandmother, Aunt Pearlie Sue's character has entertained audiences with Gullah flavored folk tales for over 20 years from the schoolhouse to the White House. And you can find some really interesting um, video clips. I loved um, looking for them on the PBS documentary, Tales from the Land of Gullah, Forrest Gump even um, uh, on Paramount Pictures and Voices of the Gullah Culture, the Hallelujah Singers. And um, she will be followed by Sekhan Nadia, who is a performer, choreographer, and dance teacher. Her genres include ballet, modern, liturgical, and she specializes in traditional West African dance and Caribbean folklore. Of Jamaican and Liberian her heritage, Sekhan preserves her cultures through song and dance. I had the delight of singing, seeing some of that song and dance and choreography. 
Um, and she will be followed by Mr. Kwesi uh, Asare, who is a master weaver of exciting, exquisite kente cloth, one of the great cultural traditions of Ghana. Mr. Asare has held exhibitions around Ghana and has traveled often to other countries. He welcomes opportunities to share the Ashanti kente weaving tradition to international audiences through demonstrations, exhibitions, interactive workshops, and hands-on weaving on the traditional and small hand looms, which we'll see some of today, adults and children alike gain a greater appreciation for and help to keep alive this rich cultural history. So I am so thrilled. Um, and that's just a piece of the bios, y'all, piece, I know. Um, y'all are magnificent. So um, let's get into the conversation. Um, tell, Tell us, tell us, we who are gathered in this unique virtual space where diaspora meets, um, tell us a little bit about yourselves, your practice and storytelling and your art and how you came to do that work. Um, maybe we can start with um, Al Perli Sue. Okay, well, greetings. Ha'ana <laughs> Fadu, all the way up from Beaufort, South Carolina. I started um, some 20 plus years ago, uh, I grew up in a Gullah community, in a Gullah family, um, and I was fortunate enough that my parents instilled pride in our culture, whereas the age that I am now at 16, <laughs> um, Gullah was seen as something that was negative and uh, was not well received. Um, people ridiculed it, but I was fortunate that my parents didn't allow us to do that. and so. Um, I grew up with a, a sense of pride of knowing who I am and um, was very proud of it. I started this, it was supposed to have been a one-time thing. I was a school teacher, um, taught eighth grade, and it was supposed to have been for a Black history um, program to raise money for a cultural arts center that was being set up for children of African descent. And so... Um, uh, my business partner at the time, or I would say the artistic director, and I was the assistant artistic director, had written a, a thing that called a play that was called Hallelujah Mahalia. And um, she had a monologue. And I read the monologue, and somebody else was supposed to do it. And, um, and I kept saying, Let me translate that in color. And she kept saying, No, no, no leave it alone. And so finally, after about, we used to meet at 5 30 in the morning before I went to work. And so I went on and I translated it into Gullah. And I said, I want you to hear something. And I started, when these were first brought you. And, um, and so when she heard it, she says, oh my God. She said, you got to do that. She said, what's that? I said, that's your monologue. And from that point on, I became the uh, storyteller and a narrator. And like I said, it was supposed to have been a one-time performance 20 plus years ago as a fundraiser. And it just snowballed and it got to the place where I was out of town on the road doing storytelling along with the group more than I was in my classroom. And so finally I decided that um, when God told me it was time to step out and do this full time, then that's what I did. And um, we later turned it into a business and for we were partners for 10 years. And then um, God told me it was time for me to, you know, to go on my own and basically just do the storytelling. And I began uh, our Pearly Sue and the Gullah Kinfolk, which is a, we do musical theater and we bring Gullah history live through musical theater. And I started that some, I guess about, let me see, my nephew's 21, 22 years ago. So that's how long I've been doing this full time. And um, it's been a journey of faith, of honor, and I get a chance to still teach. I don't have to do lunchroom duty or bus duty. I just get to tell people about our wonderful culture, which is the genesis of African-American history is Gullah history, it's the taproot. And it connects us all back to uh, the uh, motherland, it's the biblical core that connects us all back to Africa, where all of our stories begin. So I'm excited that God has allowed me to be one of the keepers of the culture. So that's what I do. Yes, thank you. And I, I hear in that such, um, listening to the ancestors, listening to the divine, as well as connection mm -hmm. to family. Of, I love how you're like um, orienting time and connection with your nephew, nephew's age, mm -hmm. 22 years. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> how about you, Sekhan? Uh, 
how did you come to this? Tell us about yourself, your practice, how you came to this work. Yes, thank you so much for having me. So as she said, my name is Sekhan Nadia. I am a performer and teacher and cultural nerd and enchantress. Um, so being a first generation American, I was born and raised right here in Detroit. And then I grew up back and forth between Detroit and Jamaica. So um, somewhat within my struggle, for lack of a better term, of uh, self-identity, trying to navigate all three of my cultures, uh, dance was what came natural. My mother was also a folkloric dancer. So literally from the time I could walk, she tied a lapa around my waist and showed me how to wind and started teaching me all the things. Um, so I've been dancing over 30 years, professionally over 20. And um, my mother transitioned in 2011. And it just was a form of elevation for me because that's how I feel closest to her when I am in that uh, spiritual element of the dance. Um, and not just her, it's just the constant reminder of where I come from, both in the Caribbean and Africa and just to earth in general. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And, and I'm sorry to hear of your lo mother's loss and yet also um, thrilled to hear of her influence and how she lives on in, in, in you. Thank you. Um, Kwesi Asade, please jo uh, join us in this and, and share with us about you and your practice and how you came to the work. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my name is Kwesi Asare from um, Ghana, originally from Ghana in West Africa. And um, um, I, I weave Kente cloth and uh, I'm a mathematician as well. And I, I teach math. Uh, you know, weaving is a, a very special thing to me because I was born into it and I, I lived with it and I still, still live with it. Um, the story goes that my father passed when I was only two years old. So never met it, never got a chance to meet him, although he met me. So um, that is something that, you know, satisfies my soul because all I saw of him were pictures. And um, the most significant of it is the picture that he, he took on the day of his presentation at the United Nations with Ghana's first president, Osaji for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, um, because he, he presented a Kinte piece to the United Nations in October 1960. And um, as I grew up in between former schooling, I was weaving. Um, Opein Dapa, who was his assistant at that time, um, trained me. And, um, you know, at, at the age of about 12 years, I was weaving some of um, most intricate designs you can think about in the Ashanti weaving tradition. And so, um, you know, in a nutshell, I'm, all I'm trying to say is that um, weaving is very special in my family, but it, it, it originated, um, you know, from a story about two hunters going into the forest one day to hunt and coming across the spider, Kwekwanans, weaving its web and coming home and announcing it to the then Ashanti king and um, this, this cloth being declared the national cloth. But besides that, there are two weaving traditions in Ghana, that is the Ashanti and the Ewe. And um, I specific, specifically weave the Ashanti um, because that's what my father was weaving and that's, that's a tribe that I come from. And um, again, um, going back to, um, you know, the, the story that Kente actually speaks and um, designs in, 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 in Kente weaving all have meaning. For instance, the cloth that my father presented to the United Nations was, was called Tikun Kwejina, that is in the tree dialect, literally meaning um, two heads are better than one. One head cannot go into council because Ghana was joining the United Nations at that time. So this is how important the cloth is because um, it comes with names and names have meaning and we can, you know, we can relate it to events and, 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 and even, you know, wear it like the way I'm wearing one now. Um, of course, I will wore it for this occasion, but um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to emphasize um, that, you know, Kente is a story and, you know, um, we all need to be aware of these, these, this, this story and, and the way the clock speaks. So um, I did a book, I did a book, the Kwesi and the Kinte Colors, which um, you may go onto my website and, and, and take a look or purchase one if you, wait, if you wish. But it tells the story about me growing up and, you know, um, and, and, you know, the challenges that I faced in, in the whole, in my weaving career. And, but I must also emphasize that the weaving helped me to, you know, become so good in math in, in school, you know, when I was in the equivalent of high school. And that, that is what, you know, what, what my, my appetite to um, become who I am now. But um, um, in a nutshell, you know, I, I I wouldn't like to take too much of the time, but uh, I, I want to say also that it was very special for me when I was asked to replace my father's piece at the United Nations um, in October 95, when um, the United Nations was um, celebrating its 50th anniversary. So um, I, I was faced with a challenge of presenting a theme, um, which um, um, I called uh, Junasa. The name of the piece was called Injunasa, which which literally means my, my my skill is exhausted, you know, signifying perfect. And and we wove all the designs that one could find the Kinte weaving tradition. Well, this this is still hanging there at the United Nations. So if you have the chance of visiting um, New York, you may you may be given a tour. And if you see that piece, it's, it's the one that I replace. And um, you know, again for me, this is a story, you know, because. Um, it's a very special thing for me when I weave, and um, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I relate to my father too sometimes. You know, in that process of weaving, and I've created certain designs that you know thought of him that I wove. So, um, um, in a nutshell, that is my story. And not to take too much of your time, but thank you, know, you so much. Continue. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kwesi. Uh, so, so many things within your story, which is a perfect bridge to my next question, but I, I wanted to, to highlight those things of um, the, the tradition, the weaving tradition being rooted in story, in, um, in an elemental seeing uh, in, the, in the forest by two hunters, right? And that becoming something that becomes legacy and, uh, and um, given to us over generation and generation and um, that closeness of your relationship with your father um, and that um, the weaving becomes political it's social um, it incorporates naming and the power of naming um, which is, is spiritual too um, so there's so much within the weaving um, so the next question extends from this piece of story of for you all, how does your work connect with the practice of storytelling and diaspora and the African di diaspora? How does your work live um, in that in that um, nexus? Um, uh, and whoever wants to jump in, I'll go. Yeah, thank um, you. <laughs> so, uh, like with the dance I'm going to do today, it's going to be in the style of um, calypso, which um, um, comes from Trinidad, but it was one of those genres that was birthed not too long after the emancipation. And, you know, with the newly fruit slave, most of them being illiterate, it was a way of um, telling the stories of the people. So almost like a newspaper, you know, so you sang a song about somebody being born, somebody coming in, somebody, you know, some type of scandal. So that art of storytelling within the, the genre and then the dance that goes along with it. So maybe the movements, you know, accentuate the, the scandal and the drama within the story. And I, I love how you're telling like what the dance can do and your body is also <laughs> telling the story and what the dance can do. All yes. right. <laughs> I'm probably Sue. How about you? How does your work connect um, between or live in that connection between storytelling and the African diaspora? It's so clear. You know, <laughs> you know, it was our way of keeping our history alive was through our storytelling. You know, the griot um, 
He was very um, important in the village as the keeper of the culture. And so um, I didn't realize how powerful and how important storytelling was because like I said, in a way I kind of stumbled into it, not thinking this was anything that I would be doing 20 years later, but here I am. And it allows me to, uh, to connect to my ancestral roots. We had an opportunity, um, I'm probably soon the Gullah Kent folk to travel to Sierra Leone, West Africa. We left, we went in December and returned in January, just before the corona. And it was something that I felt in my spirit that I had to do, that I needed to do. And when I got there, I knew that that, that was part of my destiny and reconnecting um, me back to the motherland. And, and it was because of the storytelling that I got that opportunity to do that. And so, you, you know, I get to address a lot of issues that we're dealing with in society that you can tell, you can uh, express some of those things through your storytelling and it doesn't threaten anybody, but it leaves a seed for people to think about. And, um, and hopefully that seed will bring forth a good harvest, especially in this um, season of so much hatred and, and social unrest. And, and I worry about the children, you know, what kind of seeds are being planted in them. So I get an opportunity to tell them the history in a way that they can understand it. And at the same time, give them a sense of something they can say, you know what, I remember this lady told us about something, da 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 da, and they start putting the pieces together. And I see this whole, uh, and I thank God for Kayla, and, and I feel like this, I know it's a spiritual thing, the connection with the triangular slave trade, you know, coming from the coast of West Africa, where Kwesi is from, ended up in the Caribbean, you know, and here to the east coast of the Carolinas. That was the triangular transatlantic slave trade. And, and so um, this storyteller just keeps us all connected and we have to keep telling the story. And, and you know, we tell it and, you, and, and it allows us to do some healing because it allows us to get a lot of stuff out in a way that it can bring healing both to us and the listener. So I thank God for that opportunity. Yeah, and one commonality that I'm also hearing between the stories is this intergenerational exchange, right? From, um, from uh, grandmother to mother to um, child, to mother to child, to father to son, um, and all the generations before, and this connection, too, of ancestors. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm uh, interested, too, in, in like your work, um, Aparli Sue, of also doing that work of preservation of culture in, in mm -hmm. language too, in the Gullah language. Right, right. Um, we do, we, 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 we do, when, when people come to our performance, I, you know, I don't want them to just come and feel like they're a passive participant. Um, our performances are very interactive. A lot of times food is um, part of it. I'm a size two, the rest of this is um, fluff. <laughs> but life, um, life. You, you know you, you, you i mean it's part of who we are um our music uh the artwork the, um you know from the from the sweet grass baskets to the shrimp nets to the hand carvings you know wood carvings you know it's all part of who we are and the language is 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 a big part of it and so we want people to when they come here or even if they come to one of our performances, whether they, you know, uh, see us with this new digital platform now, to actually experience part of the culture, not just to be a passive observer, but to actually experience it. And so, that's what that's that's part of our message. And for so long we were taught to be to hate this culture and to be ashamed of it, but it's it's a culture of, of honor and tenacity that. The enemy took his best shot at us and we're still here and yet we rise. So Kwesi, would you like to add anything into this discussion, especially around um, this tenacity? I, I love that, that that's um, coming up as a commonality and theme too, but um, your work at the intersection of story and diaspora. 
Yeah, so so um, c can you um, refresh my memory again about your question? For sure. So how, um, how does your work, um, you actually introduced us into this question, how does your work connect with storytelling and the idea of African diaspora? Um, so um, I, I look at um, the whole Kinti weaving being born um, by Kwekuanansi and his, you know, his art. Uh, the, the, just the thought of two hunters going into the forest and for food and coming across the spider weaving its web. And through that, the traditional loom being born and the whole craft of weaving and the, 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 the psychological and mental, you know, the psychological and mental thought that goes into the wool weaving process is, is and, um, you know, um, it, 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 it relates to, you know, mathematics. I mean, that for me is also very special. But again, coming back to your question, Kwekuan Anansi originator of and um, you may have heard about Anansi and this is, you know, Anansi stories are where back in the village, we gather around the fire and in the evening, you know, the adults may, you know, tell stories to kids, you know, that, that, that sort of environment is, you know, very, and very useful in children growing up, you know. So through that also, the miniature loom and the demonstration I'll be doing in this evening, um, um, you know, relates to how I want to, you know, sell, not sell my story, but, you know, get, get the next generation to also learn about, you know, my craft or the weaving tradition. And, you know, with the small looms or the miniature looms, that is what I've achieved. You know, my uh, my emphasis is to help kids be able to generate an interest. And through that, I, I teach math with it. So, I mean, for me, that is special. And um, you know, yeah, so I think I think that's that's what and how it relates to the for of course. I mean, you know, you know, to today you you'll see um, graduation ceremonies with you know. Students having kinti strips around their necks, or, I mean, feeling very proud of their heritage, of their African heritage. And I think, again, for me, that is very special. Yeah. So that, I think, that's perfect. And thinking about like the, the weaving, you know, I'm a poet primarily. And so thinking mm -hmm. about um, creating a fabric where we are all connected um, yes. across time, across space. Um, yes. across language, across the, um, all the um, evolutions and changes within um, uh, cultures of the diaspora, but we are connected still. Um, so th I, that brings me to this last question before we get into seeing your work, um, is how would you describe the connections between your work and that of the fellow of, of the collective of you all on the panel. So Seikan, how would you describe your work, for example, in relationship to um, Anne Perle Sue and Kwesi Asari? Well, you know, the, the Gullah Geechee, those are our cousins. So, and mm -hmm. it's evident within the dialect. Um, Again, me being Jamaican, but also the Caribbean, so more so like Bahamian, Turks and Caicos, that dialect, um, according to linguists, is almost the exact same thing as, you know, what's spoken there. So within like the folkloric characters, within the spirituality, because we have our Obia and Kumana and things, and they got low country voodoo and hoodoo and all that stuff, like it's it's there, that retention, you know, the, mm. even even the way we acquire the information, because so much of it is not written, it's passed down orally. <laughs> so someone mentioned um, the, the generational, you know, inclusion. So that reverence and respect for your elders as well as your ancestors. And then again, within those words that sometimes younger generation, the, we don't always know what they mean, but we also know that they're not gibberish. We understand mm -hmm. that they come from Chi, they come from Yoruba, they come from Igbo, you know? And 
the older generations, I think they get it. Like my grandmother still speaks a little Kramanti, but for me, I'm just Patwa and I understand Kolofa, which you know is my father's language. So yeah, just just that connection to uh, the Ghanaian roots that are on the island. That's uh, one of the larger ethnic groups that was brought to Jamaica specifically, and a lot of retention there as well. Because there are there are two groups. There are the ones who were brought there during the transatlantic um, trade slave trade but then also the group that came later as indentured servants which mm. i think they're not talked about a lot so you know a lot more retention within the dialect within the folklore within food mannerisms all of that um so yeah you just you just feel at home you hear Gullah Geechee and you recognize words they might say say with a slightly different twang but you're just like no i know that word <laughs> the first word i want to say that i ever found that connection with was um one of uh, one of the women who's part of a, the Gullah Ring Shout, I can't say it right. She's one of the, the Ring Shout groups, and she was telling a story, and she said something about putting her hand on her Kimbo. Mm -hmm. Only person I've ever heard say that word is my grandmother. You know, mm. and she would say, "Take your hand off your Kimbo," and I'm like, "What?" But it means <laughs> hip, right? Mm -hmm. And so to have somebody from this island over here saying the exact same word as somebody way over there, we're so closely related. I love that you're, you're reminding us that we're, we're at the same table, right? So yeah. <laughs> um, there's a shared linguistic um, exchanges also, um, and the language can carry culture, can carry so many other things. Um, and that's a perfect connection. And probably Sue, how about you? How do you see yourself in relationship to the other artists who are gathered here today? Family, simply family. Um, I can remember when uh, the first, when I, I graduated from Howard University by undergraduate degree. And I went there and um, people would ask me, um, I stayed at uh, Meridian Hill Dormitory. And so um, two of my neighbors, one was from Trinidad and the other guy was from Cleveland. And some of my friends were from Lagos, Nigeria. And so people would ask me if I was from the islands. Well, I would get excited because all of Beaufort County is an island. If you don't mm -hmm. like water, don't come to Beaufort County. <laughs> um, in fact, the city of Beaufort is a peninsula. So, you know, you, it's a bunch of barrier islands and sea islands. So when they say, are you from the islands? I grew up on Ladies Island. I say, yeah. <laughs> and then they say, what island? St. Croix, St. Thomas. And then back then I was really cussing up. And so I'd get the fussed and they say, oh Lord, don't get that geek from South Carolina. She'll put the roots on you. <laughs> I didn't know anything about Roots. When they talk, started talking about Roots, I thought they were talking about Alex Haley's movie. So that was that, you know, folks would come and ask me for a number. I didn't know what they were talking about. I thought they wanted my uh, phone number. And then the only person that could really understand me talking, especially when I would get upset, would be my friends from Lagos mm -hmm. and my neighbor from Trinidad. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, unlike a lot of folks that left from the South, and went further north, but be it DC or New York or whatever, you know, they tried so hard to get rid of their accent. Well, I was determined to keep mine. I didn't care that you didn't understand me. That was your business. Were well, you talking too fast? No, you listening too slow. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so, you know, and, and a part of that was my grandmother and me, because, you know, my grandmother was the real Madea. You know, she, Tyler Perry plays the Madea, but she was the real Madea, carried a pistol in her pocketbook, cussed like a sailor. And, didn't call. She was uh, the housekeeper and the cook for a big and uh, a big antebellum house, but she never called anybody Miss Helen. It was always Helen Winnie, get out of my kitchen. So I grew up with that. And so when I see what we're doing here, I, I'm just glad to be with family. Mm. I'm happy to be with family. And so we have to understand that. And and so you know, I'm excited. That's one reason why I'm so excited about Kamala. You know, family. Mm. You know, stop with this dividing us. We are family. Mm -hmm. And if it, and if and the truth be told, everybody came from Africa. So we all cousins. Amen. <laughs> and I'm done. <laughs> Amen on that. Um, Quincy, what do you have to um, how do you see your work in relationship to Sekan and Ampho Lisu um, in artistry? Well, she, she said we are family. That's that's the way I feel. Yeah. You know, I can't pronounce her name very well, but, I, you know, I feel that sisterly feeling already. Both of them, you know, and, you know, I, it's very special, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, the whole connection about, you know, 
storytelling and uh, individual crafts and how you know it relates to you know uh, past generations and the African diaspora and you know representation and uh, I think it's beautiful. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I got chills as you all are speaking. I got goosebumps thinking about the, this interconnection between us all and um, family, again, feasting at the same table. Um, so this is, this is the magic time, y'all. This is the time when we actually get to see you in your art, experience um, the wonders that you have to share with us. And I, and I don't say that lightly. I know that this is going to be truly um, amazing. Um, so, Aunt Pearly Sue, Aunt Pearly Sue, you're, you're starting us out. Um, okay. Listen, you're chilling. Listen, you're chilling. Listen, you're chilling. Why's I tell the story? Listen, you're chilling. Uh, listen, you're chilling. Jesus come from heaven for said we free say no more slavery and no more chain. Jesus be savior forever reign. No man may master me so be free. Jesus King of Kings be the Lord of me. You better listen, you're chilling. Uh, listen, you're chilling. Uh, listen, you're chilling. Why's I tell the story? Listen, you're chilling. Uh, listen, you're chilling. Jesus come from heaven for said we free. Now, you know, there was once a great king, a mighty king, a wise king, a prosperous king by the name of Massa Musa. Oh, yes, sir, from Mali, West Africa. Folks, most folks know him as the gold emperor. I call him great, 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 great granddaddy. So let me tell you about my great, great, great granddaddy. One day, granddaddy was sitting on his royal throne, rocking in his royal rocking chair. Mm-hmm, just like a this. And he was sitting there and he was sitting there. And old grandma came by. When folks call her Queen Nzinga, I call her Grandma Zinga. That's who she was to me. Mm -hmm. And she came and she sat by him and she said to him, mm, mighty king, mighty king. You know, we's both getting up in age. And the king said, well, if you say so, and when he got up to try to go, and his knees got the cricket on him, and he had to sit back down, because them, them riders brothers was messing with his kneecaps. And then he called for the royal scribe to bring him the royal scroll to see what the daily news was talking about. And he looked on that thing, and he pulled it back, and he pulled it this way, and he pulled it that way, and he still couldn't see this. He said, Lord, my eyesight just getting dim on. And then his petunia, Grandma Zinga tried to whisper sweet little nothing in his hand. He said, eh, God, what you say? Eh? Hmm. Well, she said, now nah, I done told you, it's time for you to decide who you gonna leave this kingdom to because you're getting up in age. And she went. And he said, you know, you're right about that. But the trouble was, the tradition was that you would leave it to the oldest son. The eldest son is who you gave him to. But he had one, no, two, no, three little problems. Because they was triplets, identical triplets. He couldn't tell them boys apart no kind of how, especially with the dim eyesight and the air and going bad. So he leaned over there to his sugar plum. Grandma Zinga, he said, Grandma Zinga, Zinga baby. Now, can you tell me which one of these here boys is the eldest son? <laughs> Grandma Zinga put her hand on Kimbo like this and said, what? You mean to tell me we done had these boys here for 33 years and you can't know which one is which one? And they're supposed to be your children? And you supposed to be the all wise, all knowing king, and you can't tell your boys apart. And she threw her hand up in the air like this, and she said, "Talk to the head, and not to the face." And he sucked the teeth like that, and she went kissing him. Well, that left Grandpa by himself, rocking on the royal throne, trying to figure out what am I gonna do. 
And so he called for his favorite foods when he get in a pickle. And that was a big yam and some boiled quail eggs. Mm -hmm. And y'all know what that do to an old person digestive system. I don't need to tell you no more. But after he left, had a little relief, oh, he felt better. And he came up with an idea. So he called for his royal subject. Royal subject came a running. He said, listen, y'all, I want you to go and I want you to build a room on to this palace. Well, the royal subject said, yes, sir, sir. Got and did just that. Went and built the room. Now he forgot he ain't put no windows or no doors. So we had to call for his wife to come cut a door with to let him out. So when he came out, he fell down on his knees, down to the foot of the king. And he said, oh, humble sire, the room is surpassed. Well, when the king knew that the room was all surpassed, he called for a tree suffers. First one, he said, crazy, Conte. Come on, y'all, Kenji. Well, them three boys came around. And he told them, listen, here, it's time for me to decide on which one of you boys to leave this year kingdom to. And so says all of y'all is the same age. You can't just leave it to the elders because they don't know which one of y'all is. But I tell you what I done come up with. I done had a room built onto this castle. And I want you to go search the world over. And I want you to find something special to bring to put in that room that's going to make a difference. Hmm. But that first boy, Kunta, he said, I got this. Yeah. He said, Father, that's all you need? That's all you want? Baba, that's it? He said, that's all. So he went searching the world. He went all around the world to the finest furniture place. He went to Habitis, went to Dixie first, went to Wally World. Went to Taj Shea, went all the way around the world, found all of the fanciest things, and he brought it and put it in that room, got it all decked, arrayed it up, even stopped by and got some of that accessories. Mm hmm. Came and told the king, Come on, Daddy, you gonna love this year. Daddy, I'm telling you, it's the bestest you ever did see. Did y'all ever know somebody that doesn't know everything? You can't tell them nothing, brag about everything. Think he know everything in the big way, but that was good. But when the daddy came and the king got to the door of the new room, he stopped. And Kunta said, why are you stopping? He said, listen, your boy, it's dark in there. He said, but come on in, father. You can find the finest furniture from the best craftsmen from all over the world. Daddy shake your head, say, no, son. Can't go in no dark place. But the little bit I see look good, though. And the daddy back it up, back it up, back it up, back it up. And went back and sat on the throne. Now that second boy, his name is Kente. Mm-hmm. Oh, humble, filled with humility. Sweet talker, when he talk, I tell you, honey, we just ooze all down, yeah. Mm -hmm. When he sneeze, <laughs> powdered sugar come from every rich way, every opening they had, powdered sugar would come up because he was such a sweet talker. Humble, you say? Mm. False humility, that's what I say. Because as long as it been in front of the daddy face, it been sweet as apple pie. But when he get behind the daddy back, he tell him, daddy brother, go to, go have a hand by some furniture. Daddy owns the whole kingdom. He ain't need no furniture. I know what daddy like. Well, he went all over the world. He said, I'm gonna get all the daddy favorite foods. Mm-hmm. Mm he went about out back. He went by in back. Mm-hmm. He went by Burger King, Habit Jewelry. He went by Nicodemus. Super size. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Been all over the place. And I was sitting on my porch just like this, rocking in my rocking chair. Came by my house and he started smelling stuff. He said, Miss mm, Pearly Sue, what that is? I said, Boy, that's my sweet tater pie. <laughs> sweet tater pie. 
He said, can I have one of them Z to the power for my dad? I said, boy, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? He said, he said, my dad is the king. I said, boy, shut your mouth. Did that, you, boy, don't you lie to me. He said, yes, ma'am. The king, my daddy. My daddy, man, Samusa. Shut your mouth. I said, boy, come on in here. I gave him a sweet tater pie. I had some day old collard greens, you know them ones? They got them ham hocks in this, them greasy greens, you know? <laughs> Going easy. Come out greasy. Mm -hmm. I had some red rice with some Roger, Roger with smoked sausage in it. I sure did. I did, and I said that I made some cornbread. I said, boy, just give me 22 minutes. You know, you can't have no, no collard greens without no cornbread. In 22 minutes, I had that Jiffy ready. I showed it. I said, boy, I ain't got time to fry no chicken, but you go on down there to the colonel, because I gave him them 11 secret spices. He didn't know how to fry no chicken until I came in there, but I kept two of the secret spices to myself. So you go and tell him, give you two buckets of chicken, you drop a bucket over here to me and take the rest of your dad. But he went and he laid out that table. Boy, it was, ooh. Lord, the girl, oh, Lord, smell not the place make you want to slap your mom up in here. And he came to his daddy. He said, Father, come on. I got something for you. I know what you like. And daddy got up, went to that door. Oh, Lord, it was smelling up the place. But the daddy stop at the door. He said, Daddy, why you stopping? I got all your favorite food. Collard greens, red rice, fried chicken from the colonel with two extra secret spices. I'm pretty soon giving I'm pretty soon sweet tater pie and cornbread. Daddy, make you want to slap your mama. Daddy said, Oh, Lord, that mustn't smell good, boy. But I can't go no further. He said, Why, Daddy? Daddy said, I don't go in no dark places. Daddy back to the door. Back to the back. And that last boy, his name was Quasi. Being a gentle warrior, gentle spirit, truly humble. His favorite song was, If I can help somebody as I pass along then my living won't be in vain. And his brother said, boy, what y'all, what you gonna put in that room? He said, I don't know. He said, boy, you don't never know nothing. You don't never know nothing. He said, he said I don't know. See, cause he was that child that them, them folks on the other side, you know, he'd go help. He said, why are you helping them people? They ain't nobody. They ain't nobody some poor folks. He said, they somebody. He said, boy, you don't know nothing. Crazy didn't know. He said, Lord, let me go. And he went out into the sacred bush. And he sat out there for three days, three nights. And he prayed and he meditated. And he said, Lord, you got to give me direction. Lord, you got to give me wisdom. Lord, I need knowledge. I need understanding. What am I going to do? On that last night, it was so dark. He couldn't even see his hands before his eyes. And he said, Lord, if I can't even see my hands right before my very own face, how am I going to be able to see how to lead and serve your people? He said, I got to go and tell my daddy I ain't worthy. And just as he got ready to leave, he said, I can't see nothing. So I better light a torch. And when he lit that torch, light came into that dark place. and he got to run and he said I know what that room need now and he got to run it and he got to run it and he got to run it and when he got to that back to the to the kingdom his brother said where you going he said I ain't got time to stop and talk brothers I got to be about my father's business and he went and he lit up that dark room and he came back and he fell humbly at his father's feet he said father please come come father and go and his father got this time to that doorway and he opened that door and light came flooding out of that one stop room. The father said, oh, my wise and humble son, the kingdom is yours. But the other two brothers said, what you talking about, man? He ain't brought nothing up in here, nothing but some light. He ain't brought nothing. Look at the fine furniture I brought up in here. Kunta got to talking. Daddy said, hush, boy. See, until light came into this dark room, nobody could appreciate the beauty of the furniture. They said, but look, daddy, look at the fine feast that I prepared for the king. King said again, son, see, you miss it. The light came into this dark place. Nobody could even appreciate the feast that has been prepared. 
your brother has found the thing that this room needed. And that was light. And the greatest light in the world is L-O-V-E love. We're living in some dark times, y'all. Some dark times. And it's only love that's gonna bring light to this dark situation. If we don't bring love into the situation, we'll stay in darkness. We can decide that we're gonna live in the light and L-O-V-E love, or we'll die in the darkness, H-A-T-E-8. I love you, and it ain't nothing you can do about that. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. And that light, L O V E love. I love you. I love, oh, wow. I've got chills here. I know I'm not the only one. I invite those who have just had the experience of the miracle of that story in these times to write your questions in the chat, to offer affirmation as you would like. Wow, um, a perfect, perfect story um, to begin and to center us um, today. Thank you so much, Aunt Pearl Sue. God bless you, thank you. I'm gonna invite you to mute and um, turn off your screen. And then we, I'll invite Sekhan to share your art with us and your story. Okay, one second. Okay. Get ready to run! Get ready to run!
thank you so much. <laughs> and I love the, the deep breath at the end. <laughs> we were with you and the awesomeness of your joy. There was so much wind and movement and water and invitation. Say, Khan, that I was over here, like, had to get out my seat and, and, and <laughs> a little bit myself. <laughs> so, so thrilled. Okay, our last artist, we will welcome you. Um, and I, uh, before we welcome um, Kwesi to sh um, share his art, I invite those who are with us, our attendees, to use that chat, offer those affirmations. There's so much happening there um, in uh, gratitude for Aparli Su and gratitude for Sekhan um, and really speaking to the beauty of what you've shared today. So I invite our artists again um, to mute and um, turn off our video as we feature um, Kwesi and his art. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm just going to read a few um, chapters of Kwesi and the Kente Colors, um, a children's book, but makes a very good adult read as well. Okay, so I'm reading from chapter five, and um, I'll stop when you get bored, and then I'll get there. I'll get a loom and um, you'll see the bookmark that I've been working on since uh, sometime this afternoon. So chapter five, Kwesi and the Kente Colors. So Kwesi worked in the weaving shed until his back ached. He loved the feel of the soft thread against his fingers, which had become nimble and able to guide the thread skillfully to create beautiful designs. In the evenings, Kwesi sat in a circle with his sisters, brother, and cousins to listen to the adults telling folk stories. The stories almost always were about a clever spider called Anansi, who could capture pythons, bring rain to put out fires, and grow crops. One of the stories told how he had been Anansi spinning an intricate web chat that, that inspired the first Kinte weaver. Chapter six. So one day, Kwesi's teacher gave everyone in the class a small flag. These flags were one of the same design as the flags that Kwesi noticed were displayed in front of all government offices. The teacher explained that Ghana was the first country in sub-Saharan Africa to become independent. And today, they were celebrating Independence Day. Before independence, she explained, Ghana had been under British rule. The national flag of Ghana was made up of three strips of red, gold, and green, with a black star in the middle. The red is for the blood lost by our forefathers during Ghana's fight to become independent, the teacher said. The gold is for the natural wealth and the gold to be found in Ghana. The green is for the grass, leaves, and forests in this beautiful country of ours. What about the black star in the middle, Kwesi asked. That represents the people, you and I, the teacher answered and the freedom to live, in our own, to live our own lives. This is what it means to be independent. Kwesi thought about this as he walked home. I shall ask the old woman to use these four colors to weave a kente cloth, Kwesi thought. It will look nicer than the black and white cloth that she always weaves. Chapter seven. So when Kwesi got home, he went straight to the old woman. Old woman, please have a look at the national flag, Kwesi said. I want to weave a kente cloth that shows off these colors. The old woman examined the national flag carefully. That is a good idea, she said, but she also knew threads in these colors would be expensive. If you can bring me the money for the threads, then I shall buy them, she said. Kwesi nodded, but walked away disappointed, knowing that he couldn't afford to buy the threads. Where have you been, Kwesi? His mother scolded when he got home. There's work to do on the farm. She looked at him sternly. I know where you've been spending your time. I forbid you to visit the old woman again until we get the harvest in. Days went by. Kwesi obeyed his mother and didn't visit the old woman. He didn't even have time to go to school either. He spent his time on the farm and his body ached at night from the working so hard. So that's chapter eight, but from time constraints, Kwesi and the Kente Colors, very good book. You may want to um, get to it. And uh, so um, I'm just going to do a small demonstration on the loom. 
And so to give you an idea of what the apparatus is, this is my loom, this is my warp, my beta, and my shuttles, which I'm going to use. So as you can see, I'm making a bookmark, a bookmark, one that I finished looks like this. So this is what I encourage, you know, um, anybody I work with to create a design of your own and, um, um, you know, do something um, unique. So also, um, I'm going to just demonstrate briefly how the weaving is done. So I use my shuttle and I lift my beta and I take the shuttle all the way through and I beat it down. Coming from the left, I push the beater down, beat it down. So it's, it's a right and up, left down movement. So um, designs are based on sequences. You know, and when I talk about sequences, I'm, I'm talking about maybe an arithmetic or geometric sequence. You know, with an arithmetic sequence, you have to add numbers to to get a set of numbers. And you, have, you, you need a common difference. So that common difference is what I, I would relate you to maybe use black about 10 times, going back and forth. And then if you want to use white, you could use also white 10 times. So, I mean, it, it just guides you um, to be consistent in, in what you are doing. So I don't know if you can see me clearly, but... Um, I'm, I'm just doing the up and down movement. I was creating this design, the check, the check design, before I started doing the up and down movement, just to get you familiarize you with how it's done. And the checkered movement, um, the checkered design, I call it, I call it the double shuttle design, is done based on the Fibonacci sequence. For those of you who may know about the Fibonacci sequence, it doesn't follow a particular rule. You know, it follows a, a, a you know a, a very different um, pattern. For instance, um, I think the sequence is zero, one, two, three, what five, eight. So you you know one the the you have to add this the the previous number to the other to get the next term. Unlike the arithmetic sequence that I know I'll just be adding to, to each um, um, number or the geometric sequence where I'll know I'll be multiplying two with each other. So, um, so this is basically how the weaving is done. And um, um, when you have time and you sit down with your loom, you can really relax. And I mean, it, it, it makes good therapy too. So that's about it. If you want to have a hands-on, you're always welcome, virtually. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I am, I'm like, oh, I, I need a loom now. Like, <laughs> um, and I'm, one question that I'm, I'm really interested in asking of, of you all um, is around um, your connection of body as as the holder connector to your work um and i invite um you all to to come back on screen um i'm probably sue and say um of you know with with i'm probably sue for example like how do you teach your body to always have um this uh to be in connection with performance right um i just love like every single movement that you did was also aligned to story was also aligned to the use of um of um cues within the story to entice us into um interest and engagement and say kind of course like you persist um and and teaching you have to teach your body over many many years um to be able to do this work and um quasi like I, I was watching one um, video of you in connection with a, a larger loom where you were actually using your feet as well to hold the tension too. So I'm curious about like how you um, learn those skills in connection to the work of the body and holding um, within that um, all of your art. 
Anybody want to talk about that? Or is that just me that's interested? <laughs> I mean, um, especially now that, you, uh, I guess, being virtual, <clears throat> you have to, uh, I guess, I, well, I don't know. I guess I've always been animated. I don't, I just, <laughs> um, uh, my grandmother was a plus size woman. And so, um, she always made it easy for me to be comfortable in in my own skin. And so I I love dancing. Um, uh, my parents used to dance all the time. And so I guess the animation and, the, and all that, says I can't get up to dance with the story because usually I'm all over the stage, but I'm doing it live um, as opposed to doing it like this. So I, uh, I don't know, I guess. I mean, even when I was teaching, I, I was very animated with my students because mm -hmm. especially with eighth graders to keep them engaged. Um, I was always doing stuff like standing on top of a desk. Don't tell my prick, well, he's dead now. So I, didn't. <laughs> I didn't kill him. Be a blessing. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, animation is just, just, I guess, part of my personality. I, I don't even think about it. I mean, that's the first time I've ever had that question. So I guess this is kind of hard for me to even describe it. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop right there with that. <laughs> How about you say, Khan? Sorry, I was still catching my breath. Can you please um, ask the question one more time? No worries. I hear you. You, you, you brought the fullness. So <laughs> I was talking about um, how you, um, for especially for you as a dancer of like, um, you doing the work of persisting, of training your body as a way of um, a, a vehicle for um, your art. So how is it that you have come up, like what was the workshop, what was the, the learning process for you to train your body to not only do the dance, but hold the story and capture our, our um, going with you, right? Yes, thank you for that. Um, much of it, you know, although there are the technical aspects, so a lot of us do train in studios and we get ballet bar training and all that, but um, a lot of it starts with spiritual grounding. So breathing and centering yourself, if it's very traditional, like with the African drums, um, giving honor to the drummers, inviting your ancestors to dance with you, dance alongside you, dance through you, and having that connection so many times I, I feel like it's not even me, I'm only a vessel. I get this burst of energy that I should not have. I should have passed out after two minutes, but sometimes I can dance up to 20 minutes without stopping. <laughs> and you know, that's again, um, just that, that energy that we carry with us that has been passed down from, from generation to generation and honoring those stories and keeping those ancestors alive through movement, through song, through dance, because it's all vibration, right? So channeling the right vibration and then, and then just letting it happen is really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. When you said up to 20 minutes as a, as a former dancer, like company and all that, I'm just like, what? <laughs> 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 that is, is tenacity. That is um, strength. So thank you for, for offering that. Um, Kwesi, like, I, I'm also ex um, curious about that um, question, too, in your art of how, um, you know, how you learned um, to use your body to hold that tension with the weaving um, and, you know, a little bit about, like, that um, part of learning. How long does it take to really um, be able to, uh, to properly um, weave so that it doesn't work? Because that, too, is like this, this balance, right? This incredible balance that takes time. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, it, it takes about five years to, to, to get, you know, really of consistent weaving to be able to really get, I mean, you know, I mean, used to the, and, and you know, that, that's why it, it, it's a therapy, you know, weave. And also, um, uh, you know, you talk about the ancestors, um, when, when you know, you have a group of weavers weaving, for instance, you, 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 you feel the energy, you know, about, you know, I mean, the, their connectivity with their ancestors and, I mean, you know, um, 
the deepness of you know what they are doing. And I mean, and I mean, I, I think all that is very beautiful, and um, you know, and um, so yeah, like I said, it takes about five years of consistent weaving to to get all the parts of the body accustomed to you know running that rhythm that way. You know, it's it's a consistent rhythm, and I mean when you do it for a consistent period of time and you get a flow of it, and you know, it, it, it it's, it's nice it's nice to have you know that kind of um, 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 you know artistry to to be able to work with well and a, a follow-up question that's a little bit different um connected to um our work though is um well, it's a different question, um, but I was reminded of um, Kwasi, your uh, work as a, as a mathematics um, uh, teacher and mathematician, um, and I'll probably sue as an educator. And I'm curious about how the how the day job and the passion of the day job <laughs> informs the passion of of the art, um, because I, I think that they are, are seem to be very tied um, with mathematics and weaving, with educating. And, um, and, and preserving culture through storytelling. Um, and Seikan, I, I see for you, like I, I'm, um, I was privileged to see a lot of your videos and, and see that your storytelling is connected with, with your practice generally. So I'm, I'm curious about how the, um, the multiplicities of your, um, the disciplines that you all explore inform one another. So can you talk about like, for example, Kwesi, how did you determine that you were going to be a mathematician, a math teacher, and, uh, or was, was that an extension of you just, or weaving? Um, that, that's, that's a very interesting question because, you know, the weaving is what made me fall in love with the math. And so, um, you know, I, now, now weaving is very special to me. I mean, in a couple of years, I'm going back home to set up again. But you know, I, you know, I, again, that's another part of the story. But I, I, I was just meant to be here in the U.S. for just a period of time. And whilst I was here, you know, I, the intention was to do workshops to ed educate the next generation about the weaving, but at the same time, utilize my skill as a math teacher, you know, to also help the kids. So. I connect it sometimes. I do workshops in schools um, with my loom, and I'll set up the big loom, and then um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make an intricate design and explain, you know, um, what I'm doing and relate it to some math topics. I mean, I, I can even go down as, as low as doing some geometry, um, doing um, some rotation, reflection, and um, you know, translation of lines, you know, just for the kids to have an idea of what an angle is, what a ray is, and, you know. And I, 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 it's a passion for me. It's, you know, and when, when you know, I see them weaving and also enjoying the weaving and, and, and I notice that it's teaching them um, uh, discipline because, you know, with even the small loom, when you are weaving to come up with a good bookmark that, Will look pleasing to the eye you have to be consistent so um i don't know if that answers your question no it totally does and i and i start to think as a as an educator and as a teacher educator i think of so many young people are um because of the pandemic are learning from home right and their right. parents are supporting them in their practices and and sometimes um math for families is, is hard um yeah. and they've Kind of been pushed out for many different um, reasons but i think about how culturally enriching it might be for those parents to also think about oh i can help my my um child to learn math and to be in, in connection with culture through this like very rooted um weaving traditional weaving experience i can be a part of that and i can learn so um i i am really interested in that um thank you Kwesi. How about you, Amperly, Sekhan, um, this connection between education um, or another uh, uh, passion, a professional practice, and your work mm -hmm. as an artist? Um, for me, again, I, 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 you know, I say stumble, but I, I know now it's uh, divine 
you know, direction by God. But I was supposed to go to law school. That was my intentions. And um, when I had got, when I graduated from Howard, my mother wanted me to go straight back to school. And I said, just, just give me, a, just let me have a little break and I'm going straight to school. I'm gonna just take a break. So I took a break, got, well, got married right out of, right out of college. And I said, I was just gonna teach for two years. I'm teaching wasn't even on my mind, but my mother was a school teacher and my grandfather and on my dad's side and that kind of stuff. So I said, well, I guess I can go do this for two years. <laughs> and, and because I wasn't traditionally trained, I did it my way, <laughs> which was storytelling and you know, yeah. kind of other crazy ways to teach. Used to drive um, my other colleagues crazy and I ended up teaching math, which was kind of fun. And it was a, you know, when I was in high school, it was a favorite subject for me. But I had students that were, um, needed a lot of remediation. And so I had to find creative ways to make it interesting for them. And so, um, I mean, I would teach something like negative and positive numbers with, with um, color uh, construction paper. And um, and I would give them, I said, okay, we're going to add a negative eight to a positive five. So I need um, eight folks with a piece of black paper, um, five people with a piece of red paper. Everybody knew the story between a battery. If you put the battery things together to blow up your battery. So they understood that concept. And so they would blow up each other and what's left standing up would be three, three um, negatives. So they knew that eight negative plus a positive five was a negative three. So those are the kinds of things that I started doing. And then when I started teaching um, South Carolina history, which a lot of it is Gullah history, um, I wanted the history to come alive. So I got bored reading the book. So I had to figure out ways. And so we started creating um, role playing and it brought it alive. And so, um, and then a lot of times kids naturally learn to play. So if they think they're playing, then they are anxious to do it. And if you tell them they learn it something, then all of a sudden they shut it down. So that's just what, what I did. I mean, it just came, it, it, it was natural for me. Um, I realized now in my old age, I probably was ADD, ADHD, didn't know. <laughs> so I never did the same thing two ways with my kids, my students. I always had balloons or something to hold their interest. And so storytelling would be part of that. Um, if something happened in the community, um, some kind of little gang situation, we talked about it while learning math, while playing with balloons and dancing, whatever, whatever was natural. And and I and I had kids that would test out of my come in with a 15 percent percentile and test out at 75 percent because I realized that kids, if they're motivated, they teach themselves. You don't have to teach a child how to get out there and shoot a basketball; they'll shoot forever by themselves. And just like the uh, when the rap songs and all the songs that they're interested in, they learn it just like that. But now when you try to teach them spelling or something else that they're not interested in, then it's a struggle. So when you start just channeling it in that natural way of learning, it makes it so much easier. So it was just easy. It was easy for me. Um, and the storytelling was just another form of, um, like I said, when I got delivered from the school district as such and from lunch duty and bus duty that I was just free to just teach and that's what I do and I teach through musical theater and role playing and we address a lot of issues so I don't know if that answers your question but I'm a storyteller so that's what I do. It, it does because a story always answers a question <laughs> and we may not know what the question was but it answers the question it's like oh oh okay I didn't know that that was my question but I got a story and now I know. <laughs> um, so I kind of was seeing you like in affirmation, I'm reading your body like, okay, all right. So what are some things that, that um, struck you in what you've heard or um, what you want to add around um, this connection between um, professional practice or, or um, arts practice or the two combined? Yes, so I, I definitely have the two combined. I am full-time performer and teacher. Um, <laughs> with the pandemic, I'm, I'm more teacher now than performer with all the venues being closed. But um, in my practice, one thing I always do, being the cultural nerd that I am, is find that connection to the continent, right? Because again, you see it with 
even what's considered street dance. You see those roots in traditional West African dance. You hear it in the call and response, so like within hip hop, within different genres. So just bringing attention to that, because I do musical theater as well, and maybe if I'm giving a warm up or something, <clears throat> I'm using those rhythms to get people to understand movement language, you know? So always just, always taking it back to the motherland and, and reminding us that is source, that's what connects us all. Well, and of course our, our artistry is profession, right? There, there's that, right? So, um, and thinking about uh, this uh, one profession versus another, right? Yeah. Um, so we, we've got so many questions in the <laughs> Q&A. Um, so I'm Pearly Sue. Uh, we have one um, from a young Gullah man who says, how can I represent the culture to other people? Um, and that's from Trevor Johnson. Um, t just tell your story. See, people think that storytelling is, um, people want to hear your story. Tell your story, tell your grandmother's story, you know, tell your mother's story um, and tell it all, the good, the bad and the ugly, because all that's part of who, you know, that gives us, you know, we get stronger from the struggle more than we get strong, you know, stronger from the victories. And, you know, just, and, I, and I mean, you know, anybody who's trying to train for any kind of, you know, you got to build your muscles up and it's not easy and it's not nice, but that's what makes you stronger. So tell tell your story and 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 one of the things i want to say to him our Gullah culture didn't end um in 1865 at the end of the civil war it's still it's still developing to this day and so you know sometimes people are coming they say well where's the Gullah people are you looking at me well, what else you need to see can't you see me i know i've been losing some weight but did i get that skinny i mean come on can you still see me <laughs> so so you know um you may not come down here and see folks um, plowing behind a mule. You know what I'm saying? So don't look for that. You, you're not gonna see no cotton fields not here in Beaufort County, but there's a lot of things that's part of our government culture that you need to know about. You need to come and find out who you are. Um, a lot of, we, right from where my house is, I'm a block away from the Beaufort National Cemetery and the remains of 19 of the, uh, U.S. colored troops from the 54th and the 55th Infantry that was the, uh, the story about the movie Glory. So they're buried just, just a block from my house. Um, that cemetery was founded um, as the last final resting place for those who fought to preserve the Union by Abraham Lincoln. So at first it was just white Union soldiers and U.S. colored troops, which were, were your black soldiers. And so, you know, even though you had the 54th and the fifth, the 54th and the 55th coming from Massachusetts, your first um, U.S. colored troops were actually mustered right from here, um, from the Beaufort County here. So it's so much history and, and no one person can tell it all. So anybody that's trying to tell you that you don't have part of the story to tell, whether you're in California, in New York, because when we left these sea islands, whether we escaped, whether we were emancipated, whether or not, um, for whatever reason, the war came to the end, we took our culture wherever we went. You know, so you have Gullah speaking communities in the Caicos, Turk Islands, you got Gullah speaking communities out there in, in Oklahoma, you got black Mexican Gullah speaking folks, you got them out in Texas, we went everywhere. So if anybody tell you it's just here, then that's, that, that's not really true. We're the starting point, but we went everywhere. And so you got to come and just start telling your story. So that piece around history and story and connection to family, we have a, a, qu a question from the um, community of, uh, for Amparly Sue specifically, but for any of, of y'all, have you been able to trace your genealogy and how far are you able to go? And I'll add this one. How does that understanding of your people's past, your genealogy inform your storytelling? Well, um, yes, I've, I've gotten uh, <laughs> uh, Molly Cameroon um, is part of my, um, and a little bit of um, Benin. 
it's part of my ancestral background. Um, and I see early on, so I'm gonna just claim it all. And so um, it's always in all of our productions, um, and we have, I have about four original full stage musicals and all of our stories always begin with a African component because I want young people to know that we're all connected back to Africa. Um, getting past all the stereotypes and all, all, all the negativity of being connected to Africa. And, and one of the things I wanna say to, since I have this platform, we need to realize that we are Africans. And even with all the different, you know, whether Sierra Leone, whether Ghana, whether this, whether that, that's all a part of the enemy's plan to keep us divided and separated. We have to understand that we are Africans, whether we ended up in Jamaica, Barbados, the East Coast of the Carolinas, California, wherever we ended up at, Nova Scotia, Canada, we are Africans. And we have to reconnect back to the mother continent. How about you, Sekhan or, or Kwesi, around this um, genealogy and um, connection to your art? Well, um, for me, I'm actually the first person on my dad's side to be born outside the continent. So my name actually means the first and it was given to me because again, I was the first one to be born outside of Liberia. Um, <clears throat> and then with the West Indian side, um, primarily Ghanaian roots as well. So always had that understanding. It's in the dialect. It's in, you know, the music. It's in the food. It's in the mannerisms. Even, you know, people joke about how like we're very expressive when we talk with our hands, but even that's a very cultural thing. So I've always had that understanding. And to piggyback off of what she was saying, I think a lot of times when we think about that diaspora connection, we always talk about from Africa to the Americas, but we don't talk about, you know, people from the Americas going back to Africa. So my dad's country, Liberia, for example, you know, um, had a population of freed slaves from both the US as well as the Caribbean, and that influence is there too within some of the dialects. Same thing with the Magala people coming down to the Caribbean, um, influencing things like the Spiritual Baptist Church and things like that. So it, you really can't escape it, you know, what, no matter what form, if it's music, if it's dance, if it's storytelling, if it's, the, if it's the culinary arts, if it's just whatever like that, that connection is there. Thank you, Sekhan. And Kwesi, did you want to um, share a little bit about your understanding of your uh, genealogy, how far you've been able to um, go back and how that connects to your, um, your storytelling, your artistry? Yeah, so I mean, you know, my, my grandfather was Ashanti, so I'm definitely Ashanti. My, my father came down to Accra Pim. This is, uh, I, you know, I, 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 you know, definitely Ghana in, in, in Africa. But the sister says something. One of my sisters just a moment ago about you know uh, whether we come from Sierra Leone, Liberia, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon. We are from Africa, and I think um, this is what um, Osage Fu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah declared on um, Independence Day on the sixth of March, nineteen fifty-seven. Um, he said at the you know the Arts Center that the the independence of Ghana was meaningless unless it was linked with the total liberation of, of the African continent. And this is what he was fighting for before he was, you know, um, uh, you know, taking off a um, coup d'etat to depose him. I mean, because he was fighting for African independence. So maybe I, I may have drifted a little bit from um, your question, but um, this, you know, I, I'm very passionate about that, you know, with, what Osajifu was trying to do at the time. So, you know, um, and my mother is from Togo, interest, interestingly, and um, they, they have a, a weaving tradition there as well. And so she comes from a tribe of weavers also. So, um, you know, that, that's my, that's quite interesting. Half Togolese, half Ghanaian. Yeah, thank you. So and and, and, and oh, I, I wanna just, I just wanna add this one thing. Um, especially with, with all the division and stuff. Um, just think about 
in the old days, and when I say old days, when I was in elementary school, the elementary kids, the uh, you used to call it junior high school kids and the high school kids all rode the same bus. Mm -hmm. We're all from the same family, even though we got dropped off at different places. Mm -hmm. Remember that, we're all Africans, mm -hmm. family. Yeah. Got dropped off, some in the Caribbean, yeah. some on the East Coast, some in, down there in Louisiana, some up there in Massachusetts, Rhode mm -hmm. Island, New mm -hmm. York. Mm -hmm. Just got dropped off different places, and I'm done with that. And here we go. We're all meeting again in this virtual space and this time um, coming together um, as, as, uh, as diasporic peoples and sharing of our art. I want to thank you all so much for sharing your wisdom, your stories, your joy. Um, and I invite folks to follow you on your websites as well as on social media or YouTube, where I found a lot of videos. <laughs> um, I was totally enchanted. Um, and I will pass it over to Elizabeth, who's gonna close us out. I'm, again, so grateful um, to have been able to be here. Today. Or Tania, excuse me, who's gonna close us out. Thank you so much for that incredible, incredible conversation. I want to thank each of our artists, Seikon on Pearly Sue and Kwesi, all sharing your craft with us. I'm so incredibly impressed and inspired by each of your stories and unique art practices. And also thank you to Reina for moderating that lively conversation. Um, and I also want to give one more special shout out and thank you to Kayla Redman, who is the brilliance behind creating and planning this program. Kayla, it's been truly really wonderful to see the culmination of all, your, all of your work this summer um, come together today in, in, in this program. Um, and so I really appreciate working alongside you this entire summer. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees who have joined us today. Um, as always, your support, your attendance is so valued. Um, and we do ask if you are able to financially support the museum to please consider making a donation. And there's a couple easy ways that you can do so. You can either text the number 56512 and type MOAD SF to give a donation or also visiting our website, moadsf.org. We also would love to hear your feedback and your experience about today's program. So Elizabeth is putting information in the chat about taking a quick program survey um, and letting us know how you enjoyed this program. Um, all of your thoughts um, and feedback are extremely helpful for us um, being able to best serve our communities. And so with that, um, I thank you all for being here and sharing this space with us and enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless everybody.